What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Game Dev Unchained, the number one podcast about game development and the lifestyle thereof. I am your host, Brandon Pham, and joining me this week, a special guest, Jason Roar. How you doing, Jason? How's it going, man? All right, so I'm going to pipe you in. Now we can finally hear you, dude. Thanks for joining us. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's good to be here. Awesome. So this is the part of the podcast where we let our guests introduce themselves to our listeners and viewers out there, who you are, where you've been, what you're up to. Yeah. So I'm an independent uh, game designer, uh, developer, programmer, one person shop. Uh, I've been making games for uh, 15 or 16 years now. And during that time, I've made uh, 19 games. So my most recent game is One Hour, One Life, um, which I've been working on for about four and a half years now. Um, and it's it's out and I'm still still putting out weekly updates for that. But um, yeah, that's my my 19th game. So I've been doing this a long time. I've uh, seen a lot of uh, things come and go and I've uh, <laughs> uh, seen the sort of I you know, started my career right as the in, independent game development scene was kind of on the rise and have uh, seen the, the glory days and the bust days and the in the apocalypse and seen seen through it all right so uh, it's actually a very interesting topic that we're about to go into so i i found you through multiple articles there's actually a few uh i would say paul revere's out there <laughs> kind of talking about how the indie landscape has been changing and been changing uh for for better or for worse but i guess in this instant uh can you kind of give us some kind of uh is it a a bang or bust right now where we are with the indie scene uh well i, I so i you know I, I gave a talk at gdc last year uh sort of a uh, i'm a i'm an indie apocalypse skeptic <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so i there's something that has happened but the way people interpret it is that nobody's making money with independent video games anymore. And that's just mm -hmm. completely false. Um, there's a lot of people making way more money with independent video games than they ever have made in the past. Mm -hmm. um, now, because the audience has gotten so much bigger. Um, so what happened though, was that of course the marketplace got more crowded uh, and a place like steam, which was the sort of gatekeeper historically for independent video games uh back in the day i mean people who are who are putting games on steam today probably don't know this or don't remember it but there was a time where you had to beg to get your game on steam you had yeah. to have some kind of connection or you had to show your game to steam they were vetting games they were just flat out actually so for sleep is death which came out in 2010 uh i don't think i even tried to put it on steam um but they eventually wrote to me and were like oh sleep is death looks cool dude like let's put this on steam and we kind of had a few emails back and forth uh, and then they went radio silent for like mm. months. <laughs> and then finally I kept emailing them and they never emailed back. And then somebody else, the person who I'd been talking to at Steam had left Steam. And then somebody else got back to me and said, no, we changed our mind. <laughs> so, so Sleep and Death was never on Steam back in 2010, right? Um, and then for my next game inside of Starfield Sky, I was like, this is a much better fit for Steam. Like, you know, it really should be on Steam. It, it sold well off. I mean, it, Sleep is Death sold well on my own website as well. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, I had to call you know basically email a friend who had games on steam and said who's your connection at steam and then i was emailing this person directly and they were hesitant and then for the castle doctor in the game after inside still for starfield sky they're also extremely hesitant they're like dude just put this on green light i'm like this game has already made a bunch of money off steam it shouldn't go on mm -hmm. green light mm -hmm. i basically kind of want you know it was a squeaky wheel and then they were finally like okay yeah it can go on steam <laughs> but back then when inside of starfield sky came out on steam it was, which, which had been like 2011 or 12 it was the only game that launched that day, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And they did all this stuff with me where they're like, no, you can't come out on Monday because this one, you know, AAA game's coming out on Monday. No, Tuesday's mm -hmm. already taken and Thursday, you know, so they, wow. they they pushed me back a week and they sketched, you know, it was a very hands-on kind of thing. And they even redesigned. So I submitted a logo for Inside of Starfield Sky and I guess they didn't like it or thought it was too confusing. Wow. So their art department inside Valve redesigned my logo for me without they didn't even really ask me they were just like here's your logo <laughs> wow man this no, night and really day weird. because because right now it's, it's all automated right yeah it's a different time uh, they still hand vet something um <laughs> something. i can't remember well yeah so they still play the game make sure that it launches on some mm -hmm. test platforms that they have I internally see. and they look for anything that flagrantly violates the rules right so uh one hour in life, which is my most recent game, I, it launched off Steam back in February 2018. Didn't launch on Steam until uh, November of that year. So I, you mm -hmm. know, 
made a bunch of money off Steam. I was very successful off Steam, and then I finally brought it to Steam. And one of the things I did, because uh, I was trying to see if I could do it without ever going on Steam, right? It's like, can I, can you build up a big, successful, independent hit off Steam completely? You know, hey, some people did it. Like Minecraft did it. Minecraft's mm-hmm. never been on Steam, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I was like, you know, hoping hoping that it would be, it would get big enough that Steam wouldn't I wouldn't need to put it on Steam. Uh, mm-hmm. But it didn't, so I eventually put it on Steam. But I built this whole kind of infrastructure for, um, you know, tracking player stats, tracking numbers of hours played, tracking uh, player reviews. So mm-hmm. off Steam, inside the game itself, there was this thing where you could go and type a review and, you know, recommend or not recommend, and it showed your number of hours played, and that got posted on the homepage for the game. And that's still there. If you go look at One Hour in Life homepage, you'll see all these user reviews. kind of looks nice. like the Steam review system, right? Um, Mm -hmm. so I had that in place and it works inside the client. You don't have to go in like into some separate client to post your review. It's right there, right? When you die, you can hit post review, right? And so it was working great. But when I went to release the game on steam, they were like trying to solicit user reviews inside the game is against Steam's policy. And I was not submitting. I was not trying to solicit steam user reviews, Mm -hmm. whatever reviews people posted inside the game would still go onto my own website, but I had had to tear that out for the steam version. Right. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, anyway, so so that kind of stuff. They still obviously they played the game. They're not. It's not completely automated, right? They, they mm-hmm. looked at it in some some capacity and noticed this one feature, mm-hmm. um, and said, "Hey, this uh, this is this is against our rules, right?" Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. they're definitely not. They're not vetting games for quality uh, or whether it's good enough for Steam anymore. And now, of course, they don't even have green light. It's now pay right. hundred bucks or whatever and, and yeah. get it right in. Um, so that has changed a lot. Um, so there's a lot more games out there. I think what happened essentially was that pretty bad games back in the got, day, got in, if they yeah. got on Steam and Steam got behind them because they were innovative in some way, uh, but there wasn't really that big of an audience for them if they were had to buy with the market, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, would make a lot of money on Steam. Um, and so what's happening now is essentially games that aren't that great after all, Mm-hmm. Um, and if they're not, you know, those kinds of games are not making money anymore. That's the indie apocalypse, right? Like games mm-hmm. that you play for an hour or two and kind of experience some kind of, uh, you know, story inside or whatever players don't really in a marketplace of games that are all vying for their attention. Players don't really value that, uh, mm-hmm. in the way that they did a long time ago. So a lot of those people who are trying to still use that same model of make like, you know, make this kind of somewhat innovative, uh, three hour narrative kind of experimental mm-hmm. narrative game those games are flopping hard right now mm-hmm. um because you don't like <laughs> so the other thing is that you have like i don't know you've seen probably sales curves for games from back in the day it's like mm-hmm. this big spike on launch day with this long kind of mm-hmm. exponential uh, decay tail mm-hmm. um and that doesn't that's not what the curves look like anymore mm-hmm. so launch day is not your biggest day anymore it's like kind of uh, for me it was like five days after my launch mm-hmm. on steam that i had my biggest day Wow. Right. So what's going on there? It's like, well, there's no press. press. People don't read the press anymore. All that sort of like press embargo and all that stuff that we used to do. That doesn't mm-hmm. matter. Like there are games that are flopping that get 50 articles written on launch day and they still flop. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and my game had no articles written about it on launch day and it was a big success. Right. So it's like, <laughs> what is that? Mm-hmm. Like, I guess people don't read the press anymore. It's a post Gamergate world. Maybe I don't know exactly what uh-huh. is happening there, but um, you know, you used to go on a place like Rock Paper Shotgun or Kotaku yeah. and see, you know, hundreds of comments. Mm-hmm. Now you go on Rock Paper Shotgun and you'll see th- four comments, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so on an article, right? So the audience is not as active there. Um, and so I think most people are finding out about games mostly through word of mouth and like YouTube is kind of like a word of mouth, mm-hmm. digital word of mouth and Twitch as well, right? And so in order for word of mouth to work, your game has to be a game that you play for a while, right? Because mm-hmm. if you only play it for an hour or two hours, you might go and tell everybody about it the next day, but you're not going to tell everybody about it the next week again, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so the games that are successful are the games that um, kind of you play for, I mean, <laughs> the average person who played one hour in life played it for, I can't remember what this number is. It's something like four months or something like this. Wow. <laughs> it's like, you know, so it's from when they first started playing to when they finally quit, right? It's like, mm-hmm. so uh, during those four months, you're telling people about the game over and over again, right? And so that's mm-hmm. what, and, and you can make multiple YouTube videos. If you're a YouTuber, you can make multiple YouTube videos about it. If you're a streamer, you can keep streaming it. If it's a, like like a little like three hour long kind of narrative type game, what are you going to show on your stream? What are you going to show mm-hmm. on YouTube? You know, mm-hmm. and you're not mm-hmm. going to be talking about it three months from now. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, I think in in 
that way, I think also just players' tastes have changed and so on. But the games that have uh, fit into this mold of like, you know, some kind of replayable, deep, kind of infinite, infinite, unique situation generator kind of game, those games have made so much more money mm-hmm. than uh, the old indie super hits that we talk about, right? We talk about like Braid or Fez or mm-hmm. Super Meat Boy or something like that, you know, those indie game, the movie uh, games. I was like, oh my gosh. Back in the day, it was like, you know, 2007. I was like, Braid made $5 million. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Stardew Valley has made like, I would say probably $40 million. <laughs> yeah. And it's just one guy. You know, you know, Rust, Rust, Rust has made, you know, $120 million, right? Oh my God. You know, and, and, you know, Factorio, again, you know, at least 20, 30. I mean, this is a rough estimates, right? But mm-hmm. I mean, $5 million is, is sort of a, an indie flop <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, for, for, you know, I don't know. So, so it's like, and, and even like, you know, a game like the witness, which is Jonathan Blow's next game doesn't really fit into this model very well. It kind of defied all odds and became a, a, a pretty big independent hit just mm-hmm. because he had, you know, he was such a well-known guy and the game is so amazing for what it is. Right. Yeah. But there's not a lot of people still playing it. You know? Yeah. There's a lot more people playing Don't Starve right now than playing The Witness. And Don't Starve mm-hmm. is like <laughs> 10 years really old, old, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, I think that that... So, The Witness and a few games have kind of defied the odds just because they were so amazing that you just couldn't not play them, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and The Witness is a big, beefy... For a content-type game, mm-hmm. it's like one of the biggest, beefiest content. <laughs> it's just mm-hmm. insane. It just keeps going and going and going and being more innovative and more like jaw-dropping. And, you know, so you just like... You can you really sink yourself into it. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think in that way it does work as a sort of a word of mouth game Um, Mm -hmm. because, you know, anybody who actually plays the witness for real is going to be playing it for a good month. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Like, yep, still, Oh my God, the witness is getting better and better. It's like, (sighs) Oh, it's blowing my mind again. You're going to keep talking about it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. But there have been people who have played one hour in life uh, since launch, right? It's been out for 18 months. Mm -hmm. uh, And there have been people who have played, almost every day for 18 months. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, because it is this emergent kind of situation generator online, you never, every time you play, it's totally different. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's just this sort of infinite replayability associated with it. I mean, I'm not saying that's good or healthy <laughs> to play mm-hmm. a game for 18 months. Uh, but definitely uh, one hour life is capable of something like that. And where, where the witness isn't, I mean, you know, most people, would finish the witness before 18 months. I, I hope <laughs> mm-hmm. man, you're covering a lot of, uh, uh, situational things that, you know, I've been very curious about too. And I want to unfoil some of this. First of all, you were the before and after well, steam green light. And then now, right. Where they're mostly, uh, not really vetting, but just looking through and playing games to kind of make sure they're not in criminalizing their platform, <laughs> uh, right. with like, yeah, bad, bad taste in games or anything that might, you know, get, them into trouble yeah, but any, anything illegal <laughs> yeah anything illegal that's more their process now so like do you feel that i definitely empathize with what you're saying how now we have it seems chaotic but only because we have so many options right uh where before I guess in the Steam Green Knight days, we had someone kind of helping, but it was more like that was the single source of if you're indie, you have to put yourself in that platform. And if you make it or not, uh, it can make or break your game kind of mentality. Do you feel that was a more curated process versus now? Which one would be, which one feels better? Yeah, I guess. I mean, that's, a, that's a good question because there's a lot of good games that didn't make it on Steam or wouldn't a lot, mm. weren't. I'm not talking about green. I'm talking about pre green light, right? Like, yeah. Like, even before the days, it was like, does steam think your game is good enough? Um, and it's not in a lot of cases. I mean, I don't know that one, I don't know that sleep is death was good enough for steam. Maybe. I mean, it was pretty, it was pretty hard to get into. It was pretty hard to find people to play with. Didn't have any centralized servers kind of just said here, type an IP type in your friend's IP address to connect. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. it was a, a two player game that had no matchmaking. Um, so it probably, you know, they were probably right. It probably wasn't that good of a fit for steam. Um, you know, and, and as a, as an example, I have thought about, oh, you know, sleep is death could be released on steam now. Right. And Mm -hmm. if I were to do that, I would take, you know, a month or two and add matchmaking, right. I would Mm -hmm. take a month or two and sand off the rough edges that in 2010 made steam say no, Mm because they were probably right. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so that's, that's a really good question. I don't know. Um, you know, does this curated 
you know, the curated platform, you know, favors certain people over others, like people who have any kind of connection. Like I had a friend who had a game on Steam, right? So mm-hmm. that gave me an email address to pester back for, for Inside of Starfield Sky, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and so I had somebody to pester and uh, that worked. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I had didn't have anybody to pester, the game wouldn't have gone on Steam. <laughs> right, right. Uh, so that doesn't seem that good. Um, uh, on the other hand, you know, I guess games that kind of get vetted sort of and 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 supported by steam don't aren't necessarily successful today mm-hmm. um you know I, i'll just use two case studies these are my friends games i mean i i don't want to i don't like I, I try to avoid calling out people right but mm-hmm. uh you know i did give this indie apocalypse talk uh at gdc and when i gave it i did call out four games uh and these were games that were announced at you know publicly announced by the developers to have sort of failed or failed to meet their expectations right Mm-hmm. So, you know, game like Where the Water Tastes Like Wine, game like Tacoma, mm-hmm. game like uh, uh, Introversion's uh, Scanner Sombra, and uh, there was one more, and I can't remember it right now. But, mm-hmm. oh, Aztez. Um, so these were games that had these post-mortem articles written by the devs who were like, oh my gosh, we're never going to pay back our investors in some cases or whatever. We're, we're screwed, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I didn't feel so bad about calling those guys out. Uh, I wasn't calling them out. I was just using them as examples so that they right. made examples of themselves. And they're, mm-hmm. they're all, I know, I know all of them, right? So it's like, it kind of feels weird talking about them on stage, but it's important to actually talk about concrete examples. Right. So this, uh, what the example I'm going to talk about now has not been called out yet. I've just been watching these two games very closely because uh, they're my friend's games and I'm like, curious about how they're going to do and mm-hmm. curious about how they fit into my understanding of this whole world. Mm-hmm. Uh, the two games are Overland and Noita. Mm-hmm. Uh, Overland came out about a week ago mm-hmm. and Noitic came out two days ago, three days ago. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, Overland is by Adam Saltzman and yep. his team. It's almost, he's the cannibal guy and uh, the right. uh, you know, published dear friend of the guy. podcast. Yeah. They've been on yeah, uh, several yeah. times. He's so. a great guy. Great guy. Uh, and uh, I've been watching that game for years. I mean, he's been working on it for a long time mm-hmm. um, and I played early versions of it and so on back in the day. Um, hold on just a second. No worries. I actually have a, it's funny. Um, I have a, <laughs> this is a total tangent, but it's a, it's a somewhat interesting topic because you just heard the beeping thing go off. Um, so we had a b- really bad fire here in California, a forest fire called the, uh, the camp fire. I don't know. It was in, it was the one that burned down the town of paradise. It was kind of probably national news mm-hmm. uh, back uh, last year. And so we had all of our windows closed and we had to run a HEPA filter and stuff here in Davis. Cause the smoke, I mean, you literally couldn't see across the street really Right, <laughs> right, know, right, right. Was so bad. And so we got ended up getting one of these like particle meters to just check our air quality inside of our house. And it was horrible inside of our house. And that's why we got the HEPA filter. But the other thing the particle meter does is track CO2. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it was going off just now because I have the windows closed because I'm recording this podcast and mm-hmm. just me talking in this room. For the past <laughs> You're killing yourself. The CO up, <laughs> raise the CO2 up above a thousand parts per million when it's mm-hmm. naturally outside. It's 400, right? So yeah, that's yeah, why yeah. the alarm was going off. So I'm, I'm right, getting right. a little groggy. I'm getting a little groggy here. <laughs> we'll Anyways, so I'm watching less. these two. I'm watching these two games. I played. Um, I played Noita at the IGF. I mean, I'm also friends with Petri, uh, who's the guy who did Cran Physics back in the day. Mm-hmm. Um, really good friends with him, and I'd watched the kind of development of Noita from the sidelines. Only played it once or twice uh, before it came out. Played Overland quite a bit before it came out, um, and so. Overland, as far as I can tell, just looking at the numbers, looking at Steam charts, which is where I go to look at how many people are actually playing a game, yeah. uh, has not done well. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's gotten negative review scores on Steam. First of all, there's just not that many reviews posted. There's not mm-hmm. that many people playing it. It's like it just came out, and there's was like never really got much above 100 active players. Mm-hmm. Um, Whereas Noita, on the other hand, which just came out a couple of days ago, immediately shot up to like 3,000 simultaneous players, right? Mm. 95% positive review score. I've seen tons of reviews posted, right? Mm. Um, and, and just looking at those two games, I mean, they're both, they, they're both kind of examples of what I'm talking about to some degree, right? These infinite mm. unique situation generators. Uh, they're both extremely hard games uh, where you can, I mean, if you really wanted to play Overland all the way through, I'm sure it would take you a long time. And every time you play, it's slightly different. Um, Noita also is a, is a roguelike. They're both kind of roguelikes in a way. Uh, and, and Noita is this uh, uh, game with, uh, with wizard physics in, in a cave. And every time you play, it's totally different and these crazy things happen. Um, but so they both kind of fit the model. But why is one successful and the other one isn't? I think it just boils down to people like <laughs> it's just it's kind mm-hmm. of dumb, right? Mm-hmm. It's like people like Noita better. Mm-hmm. That's all there is to it. I mean, like you, people play Overland and they get this kind of like 
oh, this kind of beats me down and it's not very pleasant to play and it's not that interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, and they play Noita and they're like, oh my God. And they're like, this is amazing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so at the end of the day, it's still the same thing it always was, right? Um, we could talk about types of games or markets or what's popular and what's not or what you know what players are willing to pay for and not. But you know, still making a really great, 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 great game is still really hard. Um, but separate from that, it was just... It was brand new, never before seen game design in terms of like what players are actually doing in the game, but it just wasn't that good. And then, you know, I tried a bunch of different variations on it and never could find a version that was that interesting. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so I sometimes get to a point as a designer where I'm just like, I've explored this place as far as I can explore it. I got to kind of pick the best version that I found and kind of throw my hands up in the air and just move on. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, my game Primrose on the iPhone was also uh, it was a, a, a tile placement kind of puzzle game really inventive new mechanic in there about how tiles were cleared and how it worked and really cool in a lot of ways, but it's just never, I could never get the design to where I wanted it to be in terms of how compelling and how interesting it was. Mm-hmm. And I tried a bunch of different variations and a bunch of different, and, you know, finally you get to this point where it's just like, ah, eh, I guess I got to leave this one behind. I'm not going to solve this problem. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and therefore it's just not as good. You know, like if you compare it to drop seven, which is a similar game and a game that kind of inspired me in that space, it's like, Oh, I want to make a game like drop seven, but, you know, innovative in a different way. Drop seven is way better than Primrose. <laughs> that's just mm-hmm. how that's why way more people are playing drop seven right now. Mm-hmm. You know, it's been like 10 years, 10 years later than are playing uh, Primrose. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, there's not really a, a lot of people are looking for some kind of formula <laughs> or something or some mm-hmm. kind of magic bullet or some kind of one weird trick. And, and, you know, there really isn't one. I mean, sometimes, you know, just it's, it's as simple as well, you know, people like this game more, or it's more interesting to play. Right. Right. Um, I grew up in playing and I would like to make games that are single player narrative. And as we are discovering how uh, viewership and uh, streaming is becoming such a huge component to how people play games or buy games, uh, which is something that I think you're kind of vocalizing that we need to be more conscientious to kind of make this a part of the game design to make sure that there is an overlap with players who are initially excited about it and people who are slowly discovering it to kind of make um, make sense of the upswing later after launch, right? And so if the game isn't long enough and there's nothing to talk about and people are discovering it, it's slowly, I, I feel if we're looking at that graph, little gaps in between that slowly just dies out. And not create any, right. any interest. So, are you well, saying that, that, the, that, that, that? Go ahead. That spike that you get, that spike that you get at the beginning, mm-hmm. is much smaller than it used to be. Right. There were way more people who bought the Castle Doctrine on day one. Day one, on yeah. Than bought, than bought one hour of life on Steam. Castle mm-hmm. Doctrine had all its ducks in a row and had this launch contest that everybody talking about it. Every news outlet covered it. No one covered one hour in life. But even mm-hmm. if they had, there's two or three. I mean, there are like two places that covered one hour in life's launch, right? But even if they had, they don't drive the traffic like they used to, right? Mm -hmm. So getting all your embargoed ducks in a row to have Mm -hmm. like 50, this big PR blast on launch day doesn't really work in the way that it used to. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a game, so if you have a game that has that classic spike and long tail sales curve, which is what a Mm -hmm. consumable short game is going to have, because people hear about it when they hear that, read the initial article. And then after that, they stop hearing about it because no one's writing Mm -hmm. any more articles after that. Um, if you have that, you depend on this giant spike and that giant spike for most people just isn't there anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so what you might like, I sold more games month two, I think for one hour in life than I sold month one. Mm -hmm. I think something like that. I mean, definitely during month two, my, my, my sales slowly climbed right from beginning of month two to the end of the month two, my sales doubled. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that is like, Oh, people are playing this. It's, it's catching on. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's a different kind of game. It's the kind of game that can catch on. Mm-hmm. Uh, and still like, you know, 18 months later, the game is still selling pretty well. Right. Um, and so like if, if you're making these little narrative games, you need to have this giant spike. And I think the only way that you have a giant spike is if your game is just so jaw droppingly good that people can't not play it. Right. Mm-hmm. And I don't think we've seen too many examples of those. I think we've seen, you know, some of these games are like, oh, maybe f- f- five years ago, this would have been really good. But mm-hmm. by today's standards, it's not that great. And people are kind of shrugging about it. Right. Mm-hmm. And that is not a good recipe for a big spike on launch day. 
Yeah. Um, I think you know, people... No Man's Sky, no Man's Sky is mm-hmm. another example, and it mm-hmm. is an infinitely replayable game and so on, but it, it, a lot of people found that once they started infinitely replaying it, it wasn't that great, right? There was a lot right. of backlash about the game. But that game had a gigantic spike on launch day, right? Mm-hmm. I think within the first week, they sold $70 million <laughs> or something, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and that was because... It, it was a game that so many people couldn't not play because mm-hmm. there was this trailer and it inspired people and people's minds went crazy imagining what it was going to be like. And everybody just dogpiled on the thing to buy it. Right. Mm-hmm. And there have been a couple of other examples of this. I mean, like um, Hyper Light Drifter, you know, something that has a really strong visual style or something where you're just like, oh, my gosh, like yeah. I want to. And, and Noita is probably something similar. People watch. Uh, trailers and little videos of what you can do inside Noita and they're just instantly transfixed like oh my gosh I've never seen a game like this before it's so visually beautiful I want to be in there I got to play it now like mm-hmm. I can't wait uh, and so um, the other example I would say it hasn't come out yet but there's this game forthcoming game called I think it's called Last Night mm-hmm. uh, which is this uh, pixel art uh, kind of like out of this world or another world uh, cyberpunk kind of futuristic game have you seen I uh, it, it had an E3 trailer that kind of blew everyone away because it's kind of uh, it's got a moving camera inside a 2D kind of pixel art. Kind mm-hmm. of thing. It's like a cinematic pixel art game. Um, and I can imagine that game because people watch that trailer and their jaws are on the floor. Like when it comes out, everyone's going to jump on it. Right. 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 Um, right. But some of the examples, the Indie Apocalypse games just aren't they just don't they don't grab like there's something about the the name. There's something about the way it's presented. There's something about the trailer where it just doesn't like grab you or doesn't uh, inspire you in the same way. And mm-hmm. if we, if we even compare games like gone home and Tacoma for me personally, I was like, Ooh, gone home sounds really interesting. Mm-hmm. Tacoma just to me personally, as a player, never like never captured my imagination that much. And then it, there was also just like, you know, presentation, voice acting, that stuff is really hard yeah. and it's, it's hard for AAA people to get it right. <laughs> I mean, go play. Uh, what's the uh, uh, oh, what's the game with the red haired woman who's in this world with all the mechs that are like mechanical animals that are around uh, uh, the um, the Sony Gorilla game one, the Horizon Zero Dawn. No, yeah, Horizon Zero yeah, Dawn. OK, that- so Horizon Zero Dawn, giant studio, giant budget, mm-hmm. super polished in a lot of ways that game. But there's so much wooden dialogue. Mm-hmm. Like, I can't remember what her name is, but you, know, you come up to this guy again. He's like, oh. I haven't seen you around here. You want to buy something? You know? And then you come up to him again. He's like, Oh, I haven't seen you around here. Do you want to buy something? And it's just like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, it's difficult. Um, yeah. I mean, voice acting, getting good voice actors, paying for them, paying good writers. I mean, all that stuff. We've always scrimp on that stuff. Yeah. And for an indie studio, uh, I think it's even harder. Every once in yeah. a while, there's lightning in a bottle. I mean, I think, you know, I think, uh, gone home was an example of lightning in a bottle where you know everything kind of came together where the writing and the emotional tone and the voice acting and everything kind of came together in this way mm-hmm. stanley parable is another example mm-hmm. where they you just found this amazing narrator dude and he, I mean, he and davy's an am, amazing writer mm-hmm. uh and and you know it just kind of comes together into this cohesive like holy crap this is the way it should be experienced but i think it's much easier to make something that just doesn't really come together, especially if you're trying to do this narrative stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Um, something that feels clunky, something that's not believable characters, something that, you know, has uh, wooden looking mannequins that don't really animate right. And their lifts don't sync right. And there's uncanny Valley issues. It's just like, you know, mm-hmm. there's a lot of, there's a lot of sort of really hard to solve problems. Um, and uh, I mean, even like for John Blow's game, The Witness, I don't think that the voice recorders that are scattered all over the place, I don't think they work that well. Right? Mm-hmm. I, th- I mm-hmm. think the voice actors aren't quite good enough. A lot of them are reading in kind of a wooden way. Mm-hmm. There's too many different voices. And it's like, who are all these people? And, mm-hmm. you know, uh, I don't know. It just doesn't feel like it doesn't feel as well put together as the rest of the game. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he and I know, you know, I'm talking to John, like he really struggled with that part of the game. Like, what is there a story in The Witness? Mm-hmm. Is there any kind of like narrative elements? Is there any kind of thing, any kind of words in the game? And what mm-hmm. are they? Mm-hmm. And there was maybe going to be a story in the witness, but then he wasn't satisfied with it. And he had different voice actors. And he was satisfied with them. And he tried himself as a voice actor. He had professional writers helping him. And he just kept going back to the drawing board on this element of the game. Mm-hmm. So even if the mighty, the mighty Jonathan Blow <laughs> mm-hmm. cannot come up with something that's satisfying to him, you know, uh, then, you know, it's, it's, it's hard, right? Um mm-hmm. So I think that, uh, you know, I think it's, it's, it's much more sort of dangerous waters, right? It's much easier to make something that 
you know, you're so close to it. You can't really tell. Mm-hmm. You know, I've listened to this cl- this voice actors clip so many times. Is it good or bad? Like I, mm-hmm. I tried to get some voice acting done for one hour in life trailer um, where I had the, this idea of, oh, there could be this trailer where there's this young girl talking about her life. And how it started out and then a middle-aged woman and a teenager and a middle-aged woman and like you could hear the voice growing up right and mm-hmm. eventually she's mm-hmm. an old woman talking about the end of her life in this little like <laughs> one minute long trailer mm-hmm. and so I, I pitched to i can't remember what's called voices.com or voices mm-hmm. one two three mm-hmm. for voice actors and i got inundated with responses people mm-hmm. giving me free examples of them reading my script right mm-hmm. um and i listened to a bunch of them and some of them are kind of amazing for what they were it's like oh you know somebody who just did this for free you know to pitch to me yeah. Uh, but then as I listened to them, I was like, oh, this just doesn't sound right. Like, I just mm-hmm. can't like I'm not good enough as a director of actors mm-hmm. to pull this off. Mm-hmm. And as I'd listen to some of them over and over, I'd be like, well, maybe this is good. I've listened <sighs> to it too many times now. I can't even tell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that it's it's really like we. We're not those people. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Well, you're, <laughs> right. you're, you're, you're coming across as a very. Um, We're not Pixar. Like, Pixar yeah. workshops the heck out of their mm-hmm. stuff. Mm-hmm. They take it back to the drawing board over and over. They have this, like, what is, I can't remember the name of it, the story trust or the brain trust, right? Mm-hmm. And everybody who's working on a film inside Pixar has to bring it before the brain trust and they pick it apart, all the little narrative elements, any part that feels a little slow or doesn't make sense or doesn't feel emotionally motivated or. You know, and and they go back to the drawing board sometimes with projects that they're years into, right? Like mm-hmm. the dinosaur, like they just kept reworking that thing, and it never really. But they knew you know, that wasn't quite right, right? They yeah, we worked it, we worked it, we worked it, and they just couldn't get it right. Yeah, so but those those are the best storytellers in the world, and we don't mm-hmm. have those people. They're yeah, not working in the, in the industry, they're working at Pixar. They're not. <laughs> we don't have the access to that. Yeah. yeah, the people who are directing the voice actors for a Pixar film. Yeah. Um, you know, they got Holly Hunter. We don't have Holly yeah. Hunter. The last <laughs> yeah. girl, right? Like yeah, yeah, yeah. we don't have a voice like that, right? So yeah, we have yeah. these people who, who aren't good enough to be in movies, or else they'd yeah. be in movies, right? Because yeah. the pay is better. And yeah. And so, you know, we're kind of we're on the bottom rung as far as this stuff goes. We are not on the bottom rung as far as like amazing emergent systems go, though, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> like we blow those movies out of the water in that department, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So a game like Noita. It's firing on all cylinders. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing that makes you cringe a little bit or makes you feel like, oh, that's a little, that could have been done better. It's mm-hmm. like, this is it. Like, this is like a game and it's like the, it's the stuff. It's the, it's, 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 it's the way it should be. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when we're trying to do that other stuff though, very often we stumble into this territory where it's like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but like you're, you're 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 coming across a point that I think a lot of artists or a indie developer uh, simply ignore, right? We're 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 making an entertaining product at the end of it, and that needs to factor in as part of the game design because I think people have a natural inclination is like here's a fistful of money, go make the game you've always wanted to make, and we just go heads down and make that game, but without really addressing the marketing changes and atmosphere of like realistically, can it? sustain itself as a product but also is it worth a damn that anybody else cares and uh that's where art kind of limits itself for the sake of art it's like no you're still making a a thing that people want to buy so you got to factor that in as part of it Um, yeah and i think that's that's really important I, i think people tend to discount that or they tend to uh say like oh i wish it wasn't this way why do we have to worry about what's gonna sell Mm-hmm. But I think for me as a creator, someone who's been trying to make, you know, aesthetically complex and artistically relevant, supposedly artistically relevant work for my entire career. Mm-hmm. I think that, that that kind of grounding is really important. Um, we're not just operating a bubble. I'm not making gallery art, you know, for some curator or something that no one's mm-hmm. going to look at and no one cares about. I'm like making my, because I'm making a commercial product. Like I have to, it has to be good. <laughs> Yeah. Right? I can't, I can't fool myself into thinking that my bad stuff is good. Right. And, mm-hmm. and, and go a, a whole career making stuff that in the, at the end of the day, doesn't, no one really likes and doesn't really, you know, it's like, there's a certain, like the rubber is hitting the road here because I'm supporting my family doing this. Mm-hmm. Um, and it also motivates me to keep going. It also motivates me to keep making games, it motivates me to innovate. It motivates me to innovate in, in, in ways that are actually interesting to people as opposed to innovating in the sort of vacuum or something right Mm -hmm. um and so i know a lot of people who are supported by like professorships 
or mm-hmm. who are supported by, you know, they go out to seek grants as because they're like working as sort of gallery artists or new media artists or something. And some of them are making games that literally 30 or 40 people ever play. Right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and then you know, they don't even exist. Like they're not online anywhere because they were part of an installation or something, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's like, yeah, it's like, what? I don't know. I don't want, I think, I think, you know, making commercially viable art, um, which is what, you know, independent rock bands and stuff are doing as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's what people are making movies and TV are doing as well. Um, those things that I don't think that ends up being a barrier to making great work. In fact, I think it's probably where the greatest work is actually being done. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think that, you know, like Martin Scorsese in the seventies, eighties, seventies and eighties and nineties was making way greater works of moving images than uh, I can't even name some of these people, but the, like the, the gallery installation video artists. Right. 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 <laughs> you know, no, definitely. Show, like, yeah, they show like a video of some guy falling into a pool over and over or whatever. Right. Mm. Um, and you go and stand in front of it for a few, like 30 seconds and you kind of get your fill of it and you kind of feel a little bored and then you move on. Right. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, no one's going to pay for that except for a collector and the collector is going to pay enough for it that it doesn't matter that no one else will be willing to pay for it. No one would pay five dollars for it if it was made in, in the, for bulk consumption. Mm-hmm. But all these people just had to go see. I mean, if you were interested in film back in that era, and I'm not even sure what year this came out, but you had to go see Goodfellas and you had to go see Casino, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, it's just like not, if you're a film person, that movie is, those movies are incredibly relevant to you. Um, And they sold tickets, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. But they were really complex, (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. groundbreaking artistic achievements (laughs) on Mm -hmm. top of everything else, right? So it's like, uh, I think it's, I think it's possible and even important to be packing those things in. Um, and when the, the, you know, if the audience is really not interested in the short narrative kind of thing, um, or you make a short narrative thing and maybe they're interested in some, but not others. And then, you know, at the end, really you have to acknowledge maybe the thing I made wasn't that good. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's the answer. Like mm-hmm. that's always my first inclination. I always try to avoid blaming other factors. The mm-hmm. timing wasn't right. I didn't have the right the press didn't like, you know, I, the press didn't mm-hmm. understand it. Blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, <laughs> what I made probably wasn't good. That's probably the most obvious piece of evidence, you know, like the most obvious uh, causal mm-hmm. thing. Right. Um, yeah. So when, you know, first step, doubt yourself. I see mm-hmm. so many people when something flops, giving 101 reasons why it flopped. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. like, no, it probably wasn't a great game. That's mm-hmm. probably it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and so I've had things that didn't do as well as I thought they would or whatever. And it was always because they weren't good enough. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, people have a way to find people, even if you don't get press coverage and even if people don't, you know, it was like, if something's really, really good, it's hard to keep it a secret. Right. Um, the quality products but, have, have long legs. I mean, it, it just shows over and over again that at some point someone will discover the, the, <laughs> The genius of it one will be <laughs> wanting to tell someone. And that's essentially what you were talking about at the very beginning of uh, the, the the episode. You were just saying that, you know, word of mouth is still king and kind of harking back with all these avenues now for indie developers that we have so many choices now that we we kind of long for curation, but not really. Those those days are, again, you're a gatekeeper that decides whether or not certain games can make it, which is not exactly the best democratic way of like the best product being out there in front of people. But at least now we have so few resources as indie developers that the indie Oculus, the way it affects us is mostly because we're more on our own than ever before. But if you can survive this type of thing, you can survive any change in the audience consumption right as long as you know how to market yourself and make a quality product and be able to put it out in front of people that no matter wherever we we start streaming games or whatever platform that changes it it shouldn't affect the success of your game you're just adapting it's also i think there's something interesting going on here where uh there's also this um sort of pressure to innovate in a way right because Mm -hmm. innovation helps you stand out and gives people something to talk about Mm -hmm. um and so if your game doesn't really innovate that much then there's much less to talk about much less kind of buzz that can build up around it much less 
foreheads slapping when people hear about your game and like or see it on YouTube or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that 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 is probably a positive thing, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, where if you make just another roguelike platformer, um, people are going to be like, yeah, another roguelike platformer. What are we going to say about it? Right. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's even a really good one, but it's not that it doesn't do anything new. Mm-hmm. Whereas like if you make a roguelike platformer where every pixel is simulated, a simulated material that's mm-hmm. fully interactive. Mm-hmm. People are like what? I've never seen a <laughs> moving screen, um, you know, a GIF that looks like that. Right. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. like the whole level's on fire. Like what? <laughs> you know, which is noita. Right. And so I think, um, and you know, for one hour in life, um, you know, all my games have been innovative in some way or another. Uh, and oftentimes that has served me very well in terms of, you know, marketing or catching on with people, right? Like, mm-hmm. oh, the Castle Doctrine was a game where every player builds a security system and then you go out and try and break through the security systems of other players. Mm-hmm. Like that little elevator pitch is like, what? Oh my mm-hmm. gosh. Mm-hmm. Like everyone says instantly, wow, that's crazy. That sounds cool. <laughs> Right? Mm-hmm. And when I came up with the idea, I frantically ran to Google to make sure there were no multiplayer burglary games. And there were, I was like, oh, I'm the first one to have thought, like, I can't believe I'm the first one to have thought of this. This seems so like obvious. And then, you know, after the Castle Action came out, all these people came up to me, other friends and game developers. Like I was working on exactly the same thing. We never got it to work, though. So we never released it mm-hmm. or you beat me to it or whatever. Like it was just mm-hmm. this idea that was just waiting to happen. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and when it, when someone hears about it, it seems so interesting and obvious you know, like an obviously interesting thing to try playing that everyone is like, Ooh, I want to try that. Right. Mm-hmm. One hour in life as well. It's like, Oh, very simple. Like core idea, multiplayer online survival game where when you join the game, you're born as a helpless baby to another player who's chosen randomly as your mother. Mm-hmm. And, you know, instantly when people hear that, even people who don't play games, their gears start turning, right? They're like, Oh, mm-hmm. what? Mm-hmm. Wait, mm-hmm. What's going to happen then? What if she doesn't take care of you? What if she's mm-hmm. mean to you? What if she does this to you? You know? And like, yeah, that's what the game's about. Exactly. Isn't that interesting? And they're like, oh, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, so, you know, that kind of then, then if we compare that to, you know, to pick on Overland again, it's like Overland's a post-apocalyptic game in this beautiful little 2D diorama, um, mm-hmm. diorama scenes. But it's kind of a turn-based strategy game where you mm-hmm. gather resources and control, decide your, right. what your units are and decide when to spend resources and so on. Mm-hmm. Um and it's procedurally generated and kind of roguelike and but you know there's not a there's not a a conceptual hook Mm -hmm. right i just described it to you the best way that i can i can't really say anything else i can't Mm -hmm. sum it up in some way that's like a lightning bolt in your mind that gets your gears Mm -hmm. turning you're like huh Mm -hmm. i've kind of played games like that maybe i've never played one that looked as cool as this one looks it does look really amazing Mm -hmm. (laughs) visually Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe i've never played one with dogs you know, mm-hmm. or, you know, there's a couple of little cool things about it. They're like, Ooh, there's dogs in it. Or, Ooh, this, you know, uh, you gotta, you, you're gonna have to abandon some of your people and you can't keep everyone alive. Ooh, that's kind of like fire emblem, you know, mm-hmm. uh, but there's not, there's not a, there's not a, 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 a punch in the, a par, on the heart of the head. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and you know, no man's sky also exactly the same thing. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, this infinite simulated procedurally generated universe where every planet is different and you can go wherever you want. Mm-hmm. right that's my elevator pitch for the game and everyone's head just explodes when they hear that right yeah, yeah so um so i think that uh that in order to stand out among the 40 games that come out on steam every day mm-hmm. <laughs> in order to get people talking about your game in order to make your game worthy of making youtube videos about and all the other things like being that innovative is important and i think that that's really healthy um yeah you know and i think that that, is, that that pushes us and challenges us mm-hmm. to not just status quo um you know, I think another example is uh, FTL mm-hmm. uh, versus uh, Into the Breach, which was the next game. Mm-hmm. And Into the Breach was a big success, kind of riding on the coattails of FTL. But I think everyone, I think even if you go now, there's more people playing FTL than Into the Breach at this moment. Right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> FTL is like 10 years old or something. Mm-hmm. And the, you know, we talked to the guys uh, at, at, at the company. They were like, yeah, you know, this game was really successful, but not as big as FTL. Mm-hmm. Um, but even that's a simple, it's like, you know, Into the Breach is just not, you know, FTL is like, like nothing else. There had never been anything quite like that before. And it was mm-hmm. really like, Oh wait, there's this like crew and you're on a spaceship and you're running around from room to room in the spaceship and, you know, and deciding what to do. And part of the spaceship's on fire. You know, it's like, there's something like so new about it. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And into the breach was just more like, Oh, it's a turn-based kind of isometric st- strategy game. Um, so yeah, I think that uh, it just doesn't, you know, it just doesn't capture and then like grab people in the same way. Right. Right. And I think you're actually uh, 
maybe discovering the reason why a lot of these games don't work <laughs> which is uh, it, it always starts with the elevated pitch and then like extrapolating that and making people wanting to know more and be curious about what you're going to say next about the game so it, right. like getting them hooked initially is very important and getting them to ask questions and kind of shoot off ideas and get them excited is the the seed to uh making it buzzworthy and right as an indie industry right we are this is where the old ways kind of would have helped or could be helping uh smaller developers is that the 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 combination of the gatekeeper of getting financial people to put money behind your game is getting through that initial pitch making it sound like people who don't give a damn to finally give a damn uh there is something to that process that is largely missing because now that we have so much access to kind of have an idea put our game out there and self-publish you know we're not needing those gatekeepers there to kind of express ourselves freely but also we are missing that element of testing it testing the idea against yeah i mean that's an excellent point professionals yeah. So, so, yeah. so in the old days what would happen is you'd kind of make your game and then steam would shoot it down and it wouldn't <laughs> go on steam but yeah. it wasn't good enough because it wasn't innovative enough because it wasn't mm-hmm. interesting enough mm-hmm. and you would just kind of go back with your tail between your legs and blame steam for why your game didn't sell All right mm-hmm. <laughs> now you're like oh sure 100 bucks i'll put it on steam Mm-hmm. And my game didn't sell. Oh, mm-hmm. what's going wrong now? Mm-hmm. There has to be some mm-hmm. other reason. Like it's like you know. So and and also, if you needed to get a publisher behind you, you even earlier, earlier days, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, there was there was an indie industry of boxed games <laughs> back before mm-hmm. Steam, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't really know. I mean, people were buying like Aquaria. I think was being sold on the website on its own website, and it wasn't on. You know, I think it was before Steam existed, but. Um, or like Gish, right? I mean, mm-hmm. Gish was something that eventually made it into boxes on retail shelves somewhere. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you have to, you know, get a company behind what you're doing uh, with you know, money. And so yet you are kind of being vetted there. And now people are just, you're right, they're left to their own devices. And then they're, you know, they're all expecting these amazing results mm-hmm. from, you know, something that, you know, most people will tell them this isn't, this isn't that amazing. <laughs> Yeah. Now, in terms of elevator pitches, that's an interesting thing because it's like, okay, maybe some some games uh, um, are, are amenable to that, right? Like one hour of life, you can sum it up in one sentence in a way that gets people interested. Castle Doctrine as well, Noita as well, right? Um, but there's other games that are very good and maybe very innovative, but innovative in a sort of a more diffuse way, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and so then, how do you pitch that, right? Like, how do you mm-hmm. pitch uh, What Remains of Edith Finch, which mm-hmm. is really innovative. But in this, you can't really, it's not innovative in a one liner, like, you know, Mm -hmm. I can't, you know, uh, it's a narrative game with all these different kind of completely different narrative gameplay things and Mm -hmm. mechanics that are stitched together, you know, in a wacky house. I mean, it's like, Mm -hmm, and uh, the other one is the Stanley parable, right? It's like, Mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of has to be experienced to really understand what's interesting about it. Mm -hmm. And so that game is sort of unpitchable in a way, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but a game that games that are as good as those two games are sell themselves through word of mouth during the brief interval anyway. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I don't know. Have you ever, so I'm assuming you've played the Stanley parable, right? Yeah. Yeah. I okay. played it. Did you ever play the Stanley parable demo? No, most people the, haven't. Yeah. <laughs> it's really, I highly recommend it. It's free of course, but mm-hmm. When you go to play, it's like, what's the Stanley Parable demo? How do you make a demo for this game <laughs> that is so singular and just has to be experienced to even be understood at all, right? Mm-hmm, like, mm-hmm. How do you, how do you pitch, pitch it to potential customers? The Stanley Parable demo is a completely separate game that has nothing to do with the Stanley Parable. <laughs> mm. So it just... It's the best game demo ever. It's actually uh-huh. maybe, it maybe is better than the Stanley Parable. Oh, wow. <laughs> I highly recommend it. <laughs> so, right. uh, uh, anyway, so that is like an example of like, it's so singular that you can't even make a demo of it. You can't really even explain it to people. Even if you showed a trailer or shot, you know, it's like, it's, it just has to be experienced, right? Cause it's, it's, it's about the gag, right? It's, mm-hmm. it's like, it's, mm-hmm. the gag is what you're experiencing. That's, you know, uh, mm-hmm. or I don't, it's not really a gag. I don't want to simplify it that way, but you know, the, the aesthetic space that it places you in is the whole point, right? And yeah. So, uh, well, that would be the marketing pitch. And it's like, it's just something you got to experience. <laughs> like, I wouldn't talk about the game. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you got to yeah. do it. Everyone's yeah, talking about it. Yeah. 
I, I, I like to uh, would want to move the conversation. You kind of touched this a bit, how the uh, the old ways of doing things kind of staying with that theme where we relied so much on the press junket to kind of promote to have the day one sale to kind of determine the fate of our games. Right. How that is changing. And I think I've read uh, an article about you kind of highlighting how streaming and and uh, playing your game or, or, or other avenues for people to experience your game before purchasing is doing a lot better for people to actually decide on buying your game. Right. Can you uh, expand a bit, a bit? Because I didn't realize it until I actually read through it and, and listening to you that yeah, it's pretty much true. I mean, I read it just for the fun of it about like how this game is, but it doesn't really entice me to like buy now or even if the guy strongly recommends me to buy, it's like, hey, whatever. <laughs> it's not as strong as a recommendation as before. And I guess where are they catering to? Uh, obviously, their website is still a, an ecosystem for their readers where they stay within, right? It seems more like a Twitter thing. People don't click on links or anything, right? Well, you're, you're asking like who... So if people who buy games don't read these articles, which they obviously don't, because mm -hmm. the articles have no impact on sales, it seems. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, another quick example is like, and this is should be obvious to everybody, but like I've had my games covered on national public radio mm -hmm. three times now. Oh, wow. Um, and including one hour, one life, right? Mm -hmm. So... On the day when it goes live nationally, this was on the show, wait, wait, I know it's the show to the best of our knowledge, right? So I'm on a 10 minute segment where I'm being interviewed about my game, mm -hmm. um, which I think, so I did one about Passage. Of course, that wasn't even being sold. I did another one about Cordial Menuet, uh, which was available for people to deposit money into at the time. And I did another one about One Hour, One Life. Mm -hmm. um, so when the day that goes live nationwide, mm -hmm. you do not generally see even a spike in web traffic. Mm -hmm. on your game's website right because mm -hmm. people who listen to npr obviously mm -hmm. <laughs> generally don't play video games or go out on websites to find out more about video games they're fascinated by the idea they the want to hear about it yeah. Yeah. And they're fascinated by the story and this developer and his interesting idea and whatever but they are not going to go um buy a game mm -hmm. similarly i was in you know the in-flight magazine hemispheres i think it's called on uh, united airlines or i can't remember which airline it's on uh, for you know, when you're in the in-flight magazine, you're there in the seat back pocket mm -hmm. for like a whole month. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was this big, you know, profile about me and my family and about Diamond Trust of London and everything. And I've had so many people come up to me within the next year or two saying, I recognize you from somewhere <laughs> when I meet them for the first time or something. Like, mm -hmm. I think I saw you in some mag. Yeah, the because pretty much everybody's bored on the flight and they all read the yeah. magazine. Even yeah, though it's, yeah, a, yeah. it's an awful magazine, <laughs> really, it's yeah, one of the worst yeah. magazines. Uh, you know, in terms of like, oh, these articles are so short and they ask such dumb questions in the interviews. And you know, mm -hmm. uh, but everybody who ever flew that month, you know, saw this thing and 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 got a taste and read my profile. Right mm -hmm. now, none of them play video games. None of them went out and bought Diamond Trust of London or whatever was being talked about in the article. Mm -hmm. But they all saw it and absorbed it. Right, and so mm -hmm. I think that. Um, that's obvious, right? So then we mm -hmm. get over to the gaming press, which used to be the place that people went when they wanted to figure out what game to play. They mm -hmm. used to go and read these reviews. They used to go and be, you know, watching Rock, Paper, Shotgun or Kotaku or whatever to talk about um, what, you know, what interesting games are coming out. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> you know, Kotaku covered one of my old indie games back in the day, like Gravitation or something. Mm -hmm. It would just be this dr like deluge of traffic coming to mm -hmm. try the game. Right? Mm -hmm. Um or when they covered some of my games that were for sale back in the day, it would be this like deluge of people buying the game that day. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not the case anymore. So what's going on there? I think that uh, the reality is that the gaming press has actually been kind of gutted financially. Mm -hmm. um, that the audience has kind of dried up, that they're kind of in a go. A lot of them are operating skeleton crews mm -hmm. uh, of people barely getting paid. Mm -hmm. you you write to some guy who covers games and you're like, you know, you want to cover this and he's got to go beg for funding from somebody mm, to, you know, write to, it. to be able to write about it. Right. And then he'll come back and say, Oh, my editor doesn't have that. And you know, he's not willing to pay me to write about this right now mm -hmm. um, because they just don't have like the advertising dollars aren't there. Like they used to be, everything's kind of the whole landscape has changed. It's still mm -hmm. there. I mean, a lot of the websites are gone, right? Mm -hmm. um, what's the, uh, wasn't there one called one up? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a couple, there's a couple more like that that are, are completely gone. Um, 
And then a lot of the other ones are kind of run by um, like a fan community or like, you know, I don't know. It's kind of feels like destructoid. A lot of mm-hmm. those articles are written for free maybe. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and so, uh, you know, where these things used to be like these uh, hubs of the gaming world or hubs of game communities. Um, I, I think that there's sort of, there's still the appearance of it operating the way it used to, but I think the numbers are way, way lower in terms of readership, in terms of engagement, in terms of what authors are being paid. Most of the the better writers and games have left game writing, right? I mean, almost mm-hmm. all the people I know who used to write about games and were really good writers now do something else. They're all, you know, doing PR consulting or working on game development themselves or whatever, mm-hmm. right? So mm-hmm. it's like, what's left are these kind of people who are kind of enthusiasts and maybe they're barely scraping by. I mean, some, some of them will tell me if I ask them personally, Oh yeah, our website is still doing great. Mm-hmm, <laughs> like, really? Mm-hmm. There's only two comments on every article. Like what? You're right. Right. It's true. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think that that, that's just, yeah. And, 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 um, and I think, and nobody likes to talk about this, but I, and I may, I may be tarred and feathered for saying, but I think it has something to do with Gamergate as well. Mm. Um, I think that there was uh, a kind of, uh, in, in a lot of ways, I think, at least a good portion of the gaming populace felt like these websites kind of got caught with their pants down in terms of, and mm-hmm. and this is a hundred, you know, and I have experienced this myself, right? Because mm-hmm. they were covering things, not because they were good, but because they were friends with the people right. or they had a previous relationship with these people from previous games. And they did that mm-hmm. for me all the time, right? Like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, you, you, you covered passage, you covered mm-hmm. gravitation. Well, here's my new game. And they'd instantly write back and instantly cover it. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, <laughs> it was like, Pre Gamergate, like I went to Kotaku to show Cordial Minuet, which is a pretty obscure idea, right? This like mm-hmm. grid of numbers. It looks kind of like a bingo card where you're playing for real money against another person and, and outguessing them. Um, I went to the New York City offices of Kotaku and showed uh, Stephen Totillo the game. And I showed it to him for like 20, 30 minutes, right? And we played a couple of games against each other. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't even think it had finished artwork in it. I think it was just a plain grid of numbers. Mm-hmm. He wrote this like must have been like a 20 page long. It was like the longest Kotaku article I've ever seen, right? Mm-hmm, <laughs> you mm-hmm. keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. All these screenshots, all this discussion of the in, in, the details of the strategy and everything, right? Mm. Um, like that kind of article won't be written today, right? Right. right. <laughs> and he did that in part because he had been following my career and he knew my stuff. You know, it's like no. I had my foot in the door. I could I could email him and go into the offices and show him this thing. Yeah. Um, and and I think that people kind of got wise to that and realized that. People were either people inside the game industry, journalist, journalist industry were either covering their friends games or mm-hmm. games of people they were fans of right. um, without merit. Right. Mm-hmm. Or they were uh, covering games that had some kind of political agenda that they were on board right. with. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that people just kind of like, yeah, like Ugh, this, this is and I, I'd see it, too. Also, whenever my games were covered, my games often have some kind of little edge to them or something. And mm-hmm. there would always be a political comment in the coverage. Mm. right like mm-hmm. the choice of not allowing men to have babies in this game is a controversial one it's science yeah yeah but you know it's yeah. definitely gonna ruff, ruffle some feathers <laughs> sure uh <laughs> or using the word problematic to describe the design choice <laughs> that i made right um so anyway i saw that happen a bunch of times uh where it was clear that the people covering the games had some kind of political agenda or we're trying to paint me in some kind of negative political light. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and so that was all pre gamergate Right. So I, I kind mm-hmm. of witnessed this firsthand and I was the beneficiary of it. <laughs> you know, it's mm-hmm. like I'm guilty as charged. Yes. I used to email my friends and uh, not friends. I mean, I didn't know them from outside of journalism, but I'd email people that had interviewed me and become friendly with me mm-hmm. to get coverage. Right. 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 Um, and so they don't do that anymore, by the way, for the most part, <laughs> mm-hmm. when I email them, you don't have known them for years. They don't even write back. Mm-hmm. not allowed so well i don't know i don't know or they're too busy or they don't care about indie games i mean a lot of them don't cover independent games anymore in the same right that they used to yeah i mean you know trying to get people to cover one hour in life which was this you know easily coverable game because it's so weird <laughs> and there's yeah. so much interesting stuff to talk about it was like yeah. pulling teeth i'd yeah. write back to them over and over and over again and they'd finally mm-hmm. come back and say no not at this time you know it's like okay, this is definitely the most press worthy and interesting game I've ever worked on. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's also my most successful by like, you know, factor of four financially. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So like, you know, people are, there's one guy who's made like three YouTube videos a week for 18 months. <laughs> oh, wow. 
<laughs> no, this whole channel is you know nothing but you know three thousand view you or, or more. Uh, every you know he, he has a pretty big audience, and he he pretty much covers nothing but one hour in life. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so clearly there's stuff to talk about there. There's stuff worthy of you know, but like still like you know Polygon has never covered it. Uh, mm-hmm. Kotaku has never covered it. I think PC Gamer marginally covered it, and Rock Paper Shotgun covered it. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's just like, yeah, okay, Polygon's not going to cover one hour in life. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it sounds to me, man, like the future uh, is um, not exactly that. It's a different type of coverage. It's evolving, right? Now it's where it used to be about press junkets and people writing articles. And now we're aiming it more towards streamers and people. And it's actually more research to be done towards people who are doing this and streaming your game uh, to ask them like, what exactly are the type of content that you like to stream? Like what resonates with your audience and and thinking along those lines to make it more of a long tail for your game. It seems it's just like the, the, the shift is towards those people more than people writing articles. Interesting to talk about there, which is that um, I've seen giant streamers cover one hour in life, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody will email me on the weekend. Like, dude, Lyric is streaming one hour in life at this moment. Holy crap. Mm-hmm. And you go and look and you're just like, yeah, there's 30,000 people <laughs> yeah, watching one hour awesome. life at this mm-hmm. moment. And there's in that case, I remember specifically, there was like no jump in, very no in spikes. In mm-hmm. Yeah, no spikes that day. Other people, like when C's covered the game one time mm-hmm. or just played it on a stream, there was this pretty big spike that day. But mm-hmm. then he played it the next day and there wasn't the spike didn't continue right Mm -hmm. um like when dragast first covered the game on Mm -hmm. his youtube channel there was this huge bump in sales but as he continued to cover it you know that it didn't continue right so it's like there's there's this idea that first of all certain people buy games and certain other ones don't and people who tend to watch twitch streams for the most part i definitely was seeing way bigger spikes uh in the beginning when some big youtuber would cover the game than when some big twitch streamer would cover the game because Mm -hmm. it's like people who are watching twitch are not there to figure out what game to buy. They're, they're just there. killing time. Yeah. They're killing time. Well, I don't, I don't, we can well, yeah. they're uh, <laughs> they're, they're, I don't they're, want to hurt feelings. Yeah. Yeah. They're there as a form of relaxation and mm-hmm. passive entertainment. And right. they also really want to be part of this little community. Of, right. In some cases, big community of people who are chatting on the yeah. sidebar. And they want to get recognized by the celebrity that they become enamored with, who is right. a streamer, right? Yeah, um, that's the product. To, they yeah. want to get seeds to shout out to them or whatever. Yeah. Um, they th- want to hear lyrics, funny jokes, uh, mm. or whatever he's going to say about you know <laughs> vaginas or whatever in one hour of life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know that they 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 want to be there for that, and they're there because of the personality more than the game. Mm-hmm. And uh, they're not shopping. They're not like looking for. But people who are on YouTube are more like. Hmm, I'm trying to figure out what game to play. Let's watch a let's play of it a little bit until you saturate each streamer or YouTubers audience and you get all the people in that audience who are in the market for buying your game potentially. And then it trails off, right. In terms of the impact of each new video. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like each of these YouTubers has a different audience and the audiences don't necessarily overlap. And in each audience, there's some subset of people who are the types of people who actually buy your game and once it, your game has been shown to those people, it's kind of over, right? Mm-hmm. You can keep going back to the same streamer and be like, hey, you want to cover my game again? And even if they do, it doesn't really necessarily do anything, right? Right, um, right. So that's interesting. Uh, the other interesting thing is um, kind of related to this is that despite all this crazy coverage that you get in all these different places uh, where the, you, know, you have obviously hundreds of thousands of people uh, if not millions, of, I, I think the top video for one hour of life has, you know, some, some YouTuber made has over a million views, right? So mm-hmm. millions of people have seen something about one hour in life. When I was at Penny Arcade Expo having my booth, uh, this was just a couple of weeks ago, mm-hmm. the vast majority of people who came to the booth had never even heard of the game, right? which was weird, right? I'm at a, mm-hmm. a game fan conference where Expo, where everybody there is like a diehard game player. Mm-hmm. Who's walking around trying to play their favorite games and spends a lot of their time thinking about games and reading about games and watching streams about games and everything. And despite every, every, all the coverage and one hour life has gotten, you know, way more kind of coverage and attention. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, day to day, if I'm walking around and I talk to some kid who plays games, and I mentioned that I make games like in my neighborhood or something. Mm-hmm. They'll be like, what game? And I'll describe it. Like, I saw that on YouTube. Oh my mm-hmm. gosh. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there is some, you know, penetration into, 
these other kind of realms <laughs> of existence mm-hmm. outside of mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. my fans or something. Um, they probably don't own the game, but all these people came up to the booth and they're like, I've never heard of this game. Mm-hmm. You explain it to me. Mm-hmm. And I'd explain it to them, you know, and give them the elevator pitch about being born as a helpless baby or whatever. And mm-hmm. um, so, uh, you know, Chris Hecker has this old adage that he always tells ind- independent developers, which is, you know, no one, nobody knows about your game. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's how much coverage you think you've gotten or whatever. <laughs> nobody's no, nobody knows about your game, right? Nobody's yeah. heard of it. So always like know that there's just as uh, however many people you think have heard about your game and been exposed to it. There's this huge hundred times. Realm. They don't care. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, they don't care. Not that they don't care. They just haven't even heard, had a chance to hear. Yeah. Something. Right, right, right. Um, and so that is true. And so I think that with each of these, new streamers and new YouTubers and kind of there's a different segment of the audience that hasn't because the people who watch C's are not, they don't watch people watch C's don't watch lyric and the people who watch lyric don't watch Dragas. So the people who watch mm-hmm. Dragas, you know, PewDiePie has his own cadre of people and you know, each of these people has like a following. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I think that there's also, yeah, something to be said there about which, which people in those groups, are actually in the market for buying games and which are just sort of killing time or just entertaining themselves by watching games. Mm-hmm. Um, so oh, one other, another interesting thing is that uh, I had this, it's in the middle of my second month, I had this huge spike. So I was going around, going along like $2,000 a day or something mm-hmm. in the second month. Right. And then all of a sudden one day it was like $8,000 in one day and then went back mm-hmm. to normal. Mm-hmm. And I was like, what is this? And I was looking at the graphs, like trying to figure it out. And then I bounced over and I was like, Oh, wait a minute. That, that's Christmas day. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> so that's the day when all these kids who have no credit cards yeah uh get their steam gift cards and their stockings right and they've been hearing for the past month because the game came out in november about this game and they've been waiting to buy it right and right. so um you know it's weird you wouldn't think christmas day is like a day when people buy stuff be buying yeah. buying being buying stuff at all right but they're buying yeah. video games yeah, makes uh, sense. so that's all yeah. that's another thing to think about right it's like mm-hmm. that there is this as we get older, we tend to forget this, but mm-hmm. you know, uh, people my age don't buy games anymore. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not like, I, I, I'm not making, I'm not really, I mean, yes, I'm uh, people my age do appreciate the game I'm making and kind of talk about it and think about it. But most of them, even if they buy it cause they want to support it or they just want to try it, they mm-hmm. play it for a couple of hours. I'm like, Oh, I had my great experience with one hour in life. Thank you, Jason. And they're done. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, so you know, the people who are really playing games are like my son, my 16 year old son and people younger than him. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's so many barriers in, in their way in terms of actually getting a game, right? Like to them, Mm -hmm. we get these emails from people who can't get the game working for one reason or another occasionally. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And they're so heartbroken. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like either from, sometimes it's from the person's mother. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I've been trying to get my son to install on windows 10 for the past hour. And he's, he's in tears, you know, he's been wanting to play the game so long. He's so disappointed. Yeah. Or, you know, I've saved up my, my, my birthday money for months and I find mm-hmm, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. this is the one game I can afford to buy. Right. <sighs> so I, it's, it's, it's hard to kind of have that perspective from our point of view as like, you know, for me as like an adult with like three kids and a spouse and I'm supporting a family, like I never really have to think twice if I want to buy a game. Right. Right. Like I have the budget as part of my business expenses for research purposes and so on. It's just like, I don't buy that many games, but I never like, Hmm, I can't afford that. I got to save up for it. Right. Um, so a lot of these people are looking for the biggest bang for their buck because they can only buy one game for the next several months. Mm-hmm. Right. And so they're kicking the tires of every game. They're watching all these YouTube videos, trying to figure out which is going to be the best investment because they're not just going to go spend 20 bucks to try something. They're basically spending 20 bucks to join a player community. Right. Mm-hmm. And to become not somebody who has tried one hour in life, but somebody who plays one hour in life. They're looking mm-hmm. for the next discord to sink into and the next right. forums to be part of. And then the next mm-hmm. thing that's going to kind of be their game for a while. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, what are you currently playing? Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, it's kind of like asking somebody what, you know, what are you reading these days or something? It's like, what are you, what are you currently playing? You know, I, I've been playing Subnautica for the, and you talk to people. Yeah. They've been playing Subnautica, you know, for the past month. That's mm-hmm. their game currently. Right or they're currently into this game one hour life or they're currently playing factorio or they're currently, you know, sinking into Noita or whatever they're doing. Right. Um, and so that is kind of the way people are thinking about games now. Um, and this next generation, we've forgotten what it's like. I mean, I remember <laughs> saving my pennies. I mean, everything's totally different, right? So we can't compare, but like, you know, when I knew super Mario three was coming out <laughs> mm-hmm. and I had my, 
gosh, it must have been fifty dollars saved up. Uh, you know, and I couldn't find a store that actually had it in stock because it was selling out everywhere, right? And I was like calling Toys R Us every day to see if it had, came in yet. And finally, it came in one day, and my mom couldn't take me there that day, even though I had the money. You know, it's like I was calling my friend's mom to see if she could take me to Toys R Us that day because they've got one copy of Super Mario Three. <laughs> uh, you know, but but that would you know that was like something that was like an event, right? Um, and so remembering putting ourselves back in that mindset of like the majority of our audience, like a game purchase is this event, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so if you think about it that way, then, and I think maybe what had happened with, you know, the gone home successes and the narrative, the short narrative game successes like five years ago was that there was still an audience of people who had disposable income and were still playing games. And I think like a lot of those people have gotten older and don't anymore. <laughs> something. Yeah. We have distractions now. So <laughs> I got real life problems then to yeah, sit yeah. around so, and play. So then we're left with the people who have always been playing games and those types of people are not at all interested in plunking mm-hmm. down $15 right. on something that's going to be over in two hours. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, well, uh, Jason, we are at that one hour mark and dude, we need to definitely follow up with a part two on this because this is a topic that is the 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 whole seed of this podcast is about it's just understanding the market and being able to go out there and promote great quality products and be successful at it and uh i wanted to thank you for your time and this is part of the podcast where i hand the mic over to you to self-promote give attention (laughs) to shout out to anybody out there uh and it is all yours i'm gonna shut up now yeah. Um, so I, you know, I've got a lot of games on my website, but the one I'm currently working on is one hour on life. Uh, and you can find that on steam or on my own website. If you just do a search for one hour on life. Um, about um, right. Actually, right after I get off the mic here, I'm going to go put out the update for the week. Cause I've been updating it weekly for the past 18 months. <laughs> that's uh, awesome, so yeah, you can get on board with the, with the latest update. Um, and, uh, that's all I'm going to pitch, I guess. Uh, that's, that's kind of my life right now. That's awesome, man. Thanks again, Jason. It was a pleasure talking to you and I'm serious. I'm going to follow up with you with other stuff. Um, It was truly enlightening. I learned a lot (laughs) and I want to thank you again. The other thing thing I'll mention Mm -hmm. is there's the the talk I gave at GDC, uh, which was back in March of 2019. It's called uh, 2014 versus 2000 or 2000 something versus 2000 something. Mm -hmm. Financial success before and after the India apocalypse. Mm-hmm. So if you look up like Jason Roar GDC talk on YouTube, you can watch that whole thing. And there's all sorts of graphs and analysis yeah. and in-depth stuff. So that that you know is kind of a an adjunct uh, uh, or appendix to this talk or to this this podcast. We're definitely going to link that into the video description as well as the audio podcast for people to find that talk. Uh, That's how I found you and I found it very interesting as well. And people really do need to dig into this and take control of their own success. So uh, thank you again. And that ends today's podcast. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thanks. See you guys next week.